Welcome back to the Overtime Hockey Podcast presented by Let's Play Hockey and Let's Play Hockey.com on 1500ESPN.com. We have a special guest with us today, Sean Trombley. He is the head coach and general manager of the Islanders Hockey Club that participates in the United States Premier Hockey League, the USPHL. And uh, we are uh, pleased to bring on what I would say is a resume about as deep and long in a coach that I've ever seen, Sean. Man, what haven't you seen out there? Thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So, so obviously you've been you've been coaching uh, throughout uh, various clubs, and one of the things that stood out to me is uh, you've had so much talent. What was it? Fourteen straight forty win seasons. You've posted along the way with not, numerous championships and guys like Trevor Van Riemsdyk, others in the National Hockey League that have worked their way through uh, your clubs. What what for you, Sean, has been the most rewarding part in the coaching realm that you've done for all of these years? By far, you, know, you can take away, you know, the the three national titles, the eight regular season, eight playoff championships. It's for me the most gratifying experience is watching our guys have success, you know, at the next level, mm-hmm. uh, both collegiately and professionally. Uh, you know, every other year we kind of put together our active alumni list, and when you look at the fact on any given year we got anywhere from thirty to forty active alumni playing pro hockey. You know, whether it be, you know, the last two years we've been fortunate to drink out of Lord Stanley with, you know, Brian DeMullen with the Penguins and Trevor Van Riemsdyk with the Chicago Blackhawks. You know, but we get a number of guys like John the Liberty, who was a star at Boston University, who's literally playing his 10th year in the DEL over in Germany. Uh, it's just really fun to watch those guys, you know, to watch guys win national championships, you know, whether it be at Boston College or Boston University with Chris Higgins or even as recently as, you know, last week in Austin Sorowick, who was a former player of mine and is a senior captain at Norwich University, you know, there's nothing more gratifying than staying in touch with those guys and seeing their success well beyond their time here. You know, one of the things I looked at uh, among the uh, materials I was uh, previewing before we discussed here, Sean, was the balance that you have, I think, in your weekly structure with your teams looks uh, really good. And can you talk into a little bit about that, what you've done as far as you have optional skates, then you have the actual practices, you have the film time mixed in. But it looks like you give the, the, the players plenty of opportunity to you know, be hockey players and then be people too as well. Without question. You know, I think our development model is probably – the best in North America, you know, and that's a bold statement. Sure. Uh, but having done this for over 20 years, you know, uh, being at rinks in the past where they just won't turn the lights on for you, yeah. you know, during the day, and it's usually just dead ice just sitting there all day long, and for me it's just wasted development time. So having our situation here where our owner uh, made the single largest donation in Merrimack College history and had the ability to add a second sheet to a hockey East facility. Um, it's an amazing, unique situation for us where, you know, Mark Denny, he gets his ice for the men's program. You know, Aaron Witten gets her ice you know, for the women's program. And then all of a sudden we've got all this ice time that we can use at our disposal. So to have the ice for our junior team, literally from like eight in the morning till four thirty in the afternoon before the youth teams start to come, is a luxury that most places don't have. It's it's amazing that this rink won't turn the lights off, you know, as opposed to never turn them on. You know, so, yeah, we've created a model where, you know, we kind of have a pond hockey session in the morning from 8 to 9.30 where the guys come in and work on their own individual skill development. You know, so uh, a, a young kid like Brendan Van Riemsdyk for the last two years before heading to UNH this past year worked on nothing but skating. You know, he wants nothing more than to follow in the footstep of his older brothers. Uh, you know, James and Trevor, and be in the National Hockey League in a few years. You know, and he's got the head, he's got the hands, he's got the mind. He just needed to work on his feet, and that's what he had the luxury to do from that 8 to 9.30 a.m. session. From there, our guys, you know, take a quick shower, and they're with our strength coach from 10 to 11.15. At that point, we do some video with our guys. They grab a bite to eat, you know, and then they venture back. We've got another session from 1 to 2.15, each day where it might be a power skating session. It might be a puck handling. It might be just our power play. It might be just our D uh, or just our forwards. We can create it into anything that we want. Everyone's allowed to go on the ice, but if we're working on something specific, you know, that'll kind of be the routine for the day. We'll make ice, and then we do what every other junior team in North America does is we practice from 2.30 to 4.30. So uh, I don't think you can find another team that has that type 
uh, of offering, you know, to its players. And when you're doing something like that, you're also creating a culture, you know, that the guys really start to believe and buy into uh, from putting in that time, from building the relationships, from being with your players, you know, for more than just a couple hours a day, but from being with them, you know, all day long. We really do become a family uh, through the course of the year. And I think that's a real big reason for the success that my teams have had, you know, for so long is that we really are a tight knit family. Well, so, so one of the things I wanted to get to, to be a part of that family, I don't think you would disagree when you look at junior hockey, even to college hockey, it, it's in the United States, pretty regional. I mean, you'll get the odd bellows, you know, obviously out at Boston, you who will, who will come out that way. But it doesn't seem like a lot of guys from the Midwest, uh, maybe to some of the Ivies, but but travel east as much and vice versa. Why do you think that is? Is that because the opportunities are, are filled by locals? Or w- what can happen to open up that back and forth a little bit more? Yeah, I know. I think geography's always kind of been a dictator for players and where they want to play, kind of what you're saying, a kid growing up. You know, in Minnesota, dreams of playing for the U or Duluth or Mankato or St. Cloud and vice versa, a kid from Boston, you know, dreams of playing at BUBC, Northeastern, Harvard. You know, so it's it's just those usually tend to dictate. I'm really hoping uh, with the start of the NCDC, you know, that we're going to start opening our paths, you know, to players out in the western part of the country. And, you know, part of that started kind of like for me, you know, by drafting Ryan Johnson, you know, Craig Johnson's son, Craig played actually in Minnesota and yeah. played in the NHL yeah. for over a decade. Uh, his son's a heck of a hockey player and was one of my futures picks in our, our futures draft. Um, you know, and we're hoping to kind of get him to come here in a year or two um, and open up that kind of pipeline, you know, for him from California, from Anaheim's U16 team. So I think you're going to see more of that, you know, where I looked at our futures draft, we had kids not just from, you know, the New England corridor, but, you know, guys from, you know, Arizona, California and and out West, um, you know, where we're going to open up our pool to international players. You know, I've already got five guys that I've got lined up coming here for next year that are very elite level hockey players. Um, you know, so I think it's going to be an, a much broader scope, uh, as in the past where obviously predominantly most of my players are right from here, you know, in new England, um, as well as, you know, your, your occasional Florida kid, your occasional Michigan kid, uh, but I think you're going to start seeing the roster be comprised of players from all over the country, if not, you know, all over the world as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll get a little further here into the National Collegiate Development Conference, NCDC, as we call it, obviously. Uh, and I'll give our listeners a quick overview on it. It's a tuition-free uh, division of the United States uh, uh, Premier Hockey League, and it's geared toward players that are already committed to NCAA Division One teams or those who can achieve that type of commitment. Uh, the NCDC uh, will be a division of 11 teams, some being longtime USPHL members, probably such as the Islanders, correct? Uh, sure. and, and migrating fr- from an, another junior uh, league. Uh, the 11 teams are in five states, ranging from New Hampshire uh, to being its western boundary to Rochester, New York, with uh, two league members in New Jersey, marks the southern frontier of the league. So there's multiple ways players can get there. You mentioned the futures draft, obviously. And then there's the existing players and then tender signings along uh, with, with tryouts and draft. Can you kind of go through the, a, a broad brush of how you go about all of these components of obtaining players? Sure. Yeah. So, it, you know, for our league, you know, starting up next season, tuition free for the first time. And, you know, I, I'm one of the founding members of the Eastern Junior Hockey League going all the way back to 1993, 94. You know, and then kind of we created the USPHL five years ago to make hockey better here for the elite player in the East. Uh, and now we're kind of, kind of fulfilling our vision of tuition-free hockey, which is very hard to do. Oh, you know, totally, basically, yeah. It, it, you know, when you look at the 11 teams, it, we're talking millions of dollars per year in now player development, uh, which is a very bold move because, as many people know, uh, you know, on any given day, we're not getting, you know, 1,500 to 3,500 fans. You know, what we are getting are college coaches and pro scouts at our games. And for our guys, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, but basically, you know, through tremendous ownership groups with these 11 teams and guys definitely going, uh, you know, taking a little bit of a risk financially, you know, we're doing the right thing for the elite player. So, you know, through the futures picks, everyone had six opportunities to draft a player. 
um, back in January, and I thought it went extremely well. You could tell that each team really did their homework uh, in putting their draft list together, uh, which was really exciting. And I know all six of the guys that I drafted were ecstatic when we talked to them throughout that process, and even after you know we drafted, we were very pleased to be future Islander par- prospects. Um, as you said, there's organizational assets, as we call them. You know, so those are players that are either on our U16, our U18, our Premier, or our Elite team are kind of protected, you know, by each individual organization. You know, and a perfect example is, you know, Johnny Young and Mark Gallant were on our U16 and U18 respectively. You know, both have full scholarships. Uh, Johnny heading to Merrimack College and, you know, Mark heading to Colgate University one day. Uh, are going to be protected by me, and it will be members of our NCDC team next year. You know, as as 2,000 birth year players, so a little bit on the younger side, but that's also kind of the direction I think our league is heading towards, just as college hockey has, you know, in the last five to seven years. From there, we're allowed to tender up to eight players. You know, so each team can tender eight players, which I think most teams look at as like eight first round draft picks, if you will. You know, a tender meeting when a, a player. Uh, signs that paperwork, he's committing to playing for that team uh, in the NCDC, you know, and gives that team his rights. You know, from there, the last part of the process is what we're kind of working on right now is getting ready for the May 17th entry draft, which will be 12 rounds. Um, And then from there, everyone will have their camp, you know, predominantly mostly in late May to, you know, mid-July is what it looks like so far for the 11 teams. They'll have all of their futures draft picks, their organizational assets, their tenders, their entry draft picks, as well as free agents, you know, looking to make the team. And from there, you know, finalize their roster down to 30 by September, by, I'm sorry, August 1st. And then everyone's got to get down to a 23-man roster by September 1st and be ready to go for the season two weeks later. So it's an exciting new process, one that's new for everybody, including myself, who's done it you know, entering his 24th year, it's it's been really fun and refreshing. I mean, I spent the whole day yesterday traveling down to the Taft School in Watertown, Connecticut, just to sit down with one player, you know, and, and work on getting him to sign the tender for next season. So uh, it's just exciting to have players commit to us er- much earlier than, than in the past, you know, when we're obviously charging them $9,000 to play for us. So how how did it become tuition-free? Was that uh, ownership commitment? Was it sponsor dollars? What was it? It's everything. Yeah, you know, and I think everybody's a little different. I know some teams, you know, have built another, a third sheet and are going to use a lot of the profits from that sheet to fund their tuition-free team. You know, a lot of the teams own their own rink. You know, so by not having to really charge yourself for your own ice time, That's half you know, it. they're they're finding ways that way. You know, I know in our set, we're going out, you know, we're going to be sitting down with our former NHL players uh, for donations in kind, if you will. Uh, so every, you know, and obviously, yeah, there's a huge uh, burden put on the owners that are willing to make that commitment to these players uh, like never before, you know, I mean, to have our guys come in and have everything from pretty much head to toe with the exception of skates, uh, but also be giving anywhere from six to 10 sticks for free as well. Uh, it's a real game changer here in the East for sure. Oh, absolutely. And, and it, I mean, I, I, why not be a replicatable model? I mean, there's one more part of this that, that, that uh, was intriguing to me. And I, I know I, and our listeners would like to know more, you know, the Islanders have a, you have a relationship with Merrimack, correct? We do. Okay. How does that intertwine and work together? So basically, like I said, our owner made a a large donation to the school and, you know, expanded upon a great facility at Merrimack to add a second sheet, update uh, the varsity rink, if you will, you know, update all their locker rooms. And and what happened is in exchange for that, we've got over a 20-year agreement uh, with Merrimack College you know, as I said, the men's and women's team get obviously first priority for what they need to have successful programs. And then from there, you know, we kind of oversee the ice uh, at this facility, um, you know, which allows our youth programs and our midget programs, you know, to be well taken care of, you know, which, you know, we're, we're currently, you know, we actually purchased another youth program about 20 minutes from here. And I think, I don't know if I'm accurate, but I got to believe we're one of the largest youth programs in the country uh, next year with over 80 teams, 
uh, on both the ma- male and female side from mites to juniors. Uh, I don't know many teams that come near that type of number, but uh, so obviously having two sheets here, three sheets at our other facility, and still having to use you know different rinks around our area, uh, it's definitely a full time job for a lot of people and a lot of fun. Uh, but being here at Merrimack, it's a great experience, you know, for our players to literally be playing in a hockey's facility. Uh, I think it's really unique too. I think one of the greatest sells that I have for some of the guys, you know, whether they're going to head to Merrimack or a hockey's team, is you know, on a Friday night if we're not playing, it's very easy for our guys to come here and watch Merrimack play, you know, BC or Maine or UNH or yeah, whoever right it might be. But it's also easy for our guys to go down the street and see Lowell play or BU, or Harvard, or Northeastern, or UNH. I mean, we're literally like a 35-minute drive to every one of those programs. Um, so what an opportunity for our guys on an off night to watch college hockey, you know, for the guys that are committed to see their future team play, start to learn, you know, their future coaches' systems and style of play so that they can be even more prepared as freshmen like no other freshman can. And, and I, I, I agree with you. One of the best ways to, to know what you need to do is by observing and addressing what it is that you need to do to get to where you need to go. And I, I don't think you can underestimate 35 minutes uh, to any one of those uh, schools. And it's not just a couple. I mean, that is a lot of concentrated Division One college hockey. And in the process, there needs to be someone uh, that's preparing these players for that. And uh, the things that you guys are doing, I think, I think everybody is – there's a lot of models, right? And everybody's trying to find their way. And, and to me, of all the things that I've seen, this one has so much intrigue to me. And um, I love the relationship that you guys have with Merrimack, too. And uh, I'm sure there's things that you've seen and that you've probably said, well, this works, this doesn't work. What's the one, uh, this final question for you, too. What's the one constant sure. that you've seen, Sean, in all of this, from your days beginning in coaching to today, that no matter what you try to do, it doesn't change. What is the what's the constant there? Well, I think the constant is is just how we treat our players. I've always said from day one, our players are our best recruiters. And no matter who my assistant coach has been, you know, whether it's you know Chris Grassy, a longtime close friend of mine, uh, Bobby Corkum, who's now an assistant with the New York Islanders in the NHL, uh, to my current assistant Chris Diamond you know, who's a former BU All-American and star, you know, the one thing I've always told every one of my assistant coaches is that our players will never care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I've been a big believer that that our job is to educate these players, not only in the game of hockey, but the game of life. And when we have that type of culture and that belief in each other, uh, great things can happen. And, And for me, even if we're going tuition free and you can kind of treat the guys a little bit more pro like they're still going to be cared for greatly and deeply here in our organization. Well, and all you have to do is look at some of your uh, your testimonials from the players that have played in your organization with the things that they've said exactly. that have, have helped them as players and on and off the ice, which I think is 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 the most important part. Uh, a great constant uh, for sure. Uh, Sean, this is really good stuff. Uh, appreciate your sharing the message and the things you're doing, obviously, uh, to extend the game and uh, make it better. So uh, thanks for joining us here today, and uh, this has been really incredible information. Thanks a lot, Peter. It's my pleasure to take the time. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that was Sean Trombley. He's the general manager and head coach of the Islanders Hockey Club. And uh, we'll have more coming up from Sean and the rest of the league throughout the coming year. That's going to do it for today's show. I'm Pete Wagner. So long, everybody.